A very good evening aspirants. We are very happy to bring to your attention that Shankarayi's Academy is launching two programs to guide and help you in your UPSC prelims and mains civil services examination. For prelims, a new batch in our test series is starting this month. Yes, the admissions for this new pre-storming batch is open now. And the test will commence tomorrow, that is on 15th October 2022. See, this batch will consist of 66 tests and these tests will be conducted in both online and offline mode. Test discussion classes will also be provided. Hurry and register to use the most reliable prelims test series. And don't worry, for mains, we are launching the mains booster 2023 under which you will be provided 40 mains oriented tests in 90 days. The booster is a quick plan drafted for you to boost your main score. It starts on October 31st and will include sectional test, half papers and civil service examination emulators. It is available in both online and offline modes for just 4,500 rupees. So grab this chance to kickstart your mains exam preparation. And with this note, let us get into the Hindu news analysis for the date 14th of October 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Today we are going to start our discussion with this news article here. This news article speaks about dugong which is otherwise called as a sea cow. See the article says that there are only around 240 dugongs left in the whole country and majority of them are confined in the Park Bay especially off the coast of Tanjavur and Pudukote districts of Tamil Nadu. So, to conserve this vulnerable species, last year, Tamil Nadu government had set up the nation's first dugong conservation reserve in the Park Bay, spanning over 448 square kilometers. Note that this particular conservation reserve is totally different from the wildlife sanctuaries. Why is that? This is because there are no restrictions on the local communities in this conservation reserve. So, what does this mean? This means that this conservation reserve works by involving the local communities in the conservation of dugong. So, this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let's learn about dugong in prelims perspective. See, dugong, which is also called as sea cow, is a marine mammal. Its binomial name is dugong dugon. It belongs to the family dugongidae of the order Sirenia. And note that it is the state animal of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. See, dugong, it is the only existing herbivorous mammal species that lives exclusively in the sea. This is an important fact. Try to remember this. See, this herbivorous mammal species, it mainly feeds on sea grass and other aquatic vegetation. Now, talking about the physical characteristics, it grows about 3 meter long and weighs about 400 kg. See, dugongs have an expanded head and trunk-like upper lip and they share a common ancestry with other notable animal kingdom members like elephants. So, this is about the physical features of dugong. Now, speaking about the habitat. See, dugongs are mostly distributed in shallow tropical waters in the Indo-Pacific region. And Australia has the largest dugong populations and it is found along the western coast of Madagascar along the eastern coast of Africa, that is in the Red Sea and Persian Gulf and then around the Indian subcontinent and in the western Pacific also. You can see the distribution in this image here. Now coming to India specific information, see in India they are seen in Gulf of Manar, Gulf of Kutch, Park Bay and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Here you have to note that it is not found along the entire coastline of India. They are found only in the areas that we saw just now. See, they mostly live in the ocean, but sometimes they move up into the land, especially in the areas where there is brackish water. You all know what is brackish water, right? It is a mixture of salt water as well as the fresh water. Now, coming to the very important part, the conservation status of dugong. See, in India, dugong is protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act. That is, it bans the killing of dugong and also bans the purchase of dugong meat. Then as per the IUCN red list, dugong is categorized as vulnerable. 
and then under the sites convention it is protected under appendix 1 appendix 1 includes species threatened with extinction now let's see a brief about sites here know that sites is the convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora it is an international agreement between the governments to ensure that the international trade in specimens of wild animals and plants do not threaten their survival and india ratified this convention in the year 1976 now that's all about the facts related to dugong and its conservation status with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now look at this front page article it talks about the split verdict of the supreme court on karnataka hijab ban the two judges on the bench had divergent opinions on the ideas of secularity freedom of expression and effect of ban on education of girls so in this news article discussion let us understand about this split verdict first of all let us see the view of justice hemant gupta See, he upheld Karnataka's prohibitive government order. In his opinion, the apparent symbols of religious belief cannot be owned to secular schools maintained from state funds. And according to him, secularity means uniformity, which is represented by student uniform parity. So, adherence to uniform was a reasonable restriction to free expression. So, according to him, the state, through the order, reinforced equality in the state. And he also added that the state had never forced the students out of the state schools by restricting hijab. The decision to stay out of the school was a voluntary act of the student. This is the view and opinion of Justice Hemant Gupta. Now, coming to the second view, See, Justice Sudanshu Dulia, in his divergent opinion, said that secularity means tolerance to diversity. Wearing or not wearing a hijab to school was ultimately a matter of choice. See, for most of the girls from conservative families, her hijab is her ticket to education. It's very true, right? And asking the girls to take off their hijab before they enter the school gates is first an invasion of their privacy, then it is an attack on their dignity and ultimately it is a denial to secular education. So according to Justice Dulia, there should be no restriction on wearing of hijab anywhere in schools and colleges in Karnataka. So this is the split verdict given by two judges on the bench. Now let us understand what our Indian constitution has got to tell us. See, secularism, it is a normative doctrine which seeks to realize a secular society. That is, a society devoid of either interreligious or intra-religious domination. See, it promotes freedom within religions and it also promotes equality between as well as within the religions. So, from this, what can we infer? We can infer that Indian constitution embodies the positive concept of secularism. That is, giving equal respect to all religions or protecting all religions equally. So, while covering the current affairs, don't forget to revise your statics also. In this way, it will be an integrated preparation and it will be useful for your prelims as well as your mains. So, regarding the hijab issue, this case ended in a split verdict. Now, a larger bench will address the case. So, we have to wait for the decision of Supreme Court in this regard. Now, that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the split verdict of Supreme Court bench regarding the hijab issue. And we also saw about the Indian concept of secularism. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Look at this text in context article. See, this news article talks about the Interpol General Assembly meeting in Delhi. The meeting will be held for four days from October 18, 2022. Now, this meeting is significant because since the year 1997, it is the second time this body is holding such a large conference in India. So, in this news article discussion, let us understand what is Interpol and its relation with India. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. Now, let's start the discussion with the question, what is Interpol? To know about Interpol, firstly, you should know its full name. What is its full name? It is the International Criminal Police Organization. See, this Interpol was set up in the year 1923 and it is an intergovernmental organization. And currently, Interpol has 195 member countries. 
See, the main function of Interpol is to help Polis in all of its member countries to work together to make the world a safer place. Now you may ask the question, how is it possible? How can it help the Polis and all the member countries to work together? See, Interpol acts as a secure information sharing platform which facilitates criminal investigation of Polis forces across the globe. And it is done through collection and dissemination of information received from various police forces. So, in simple words, Interpol enables its member countries to share and access data regarding crimes and criminals. And it also offers a range of technical and operational support to its member countries. So, this is the main function of Interpol. And secondly, it keeps track on the movements of criminals and it keeps tracks of those persons who are under the police radar in various regions and it tips off police forces whenever its assistance is requested. So from this, we can say that Interpol aims to promote the widest possible mutual assistance between criminal police forces. I hope now you get an idea of what is Interpol and what are its functions. Now with this information, let us see how Interpol is organized. See, the head of Interpol is the president and the president is elected by the General Assembly. See, president comes from one of the member countries and he holds office for four years. Now you may ask, what is this General Assembly? See, this General Assembly is the Interpol's supreme governing body. And as we already saw, General Assembly only elects the president of Interpol and the president comes from one of the member nations. Now you should know that this General Assembly comprises of representatives from each of its member countries. And the General Assembly meets once a year and each session lasts around four days. And we saw about this in the introduction of news article itself, right? See, this General Assembly only lays down the policy for execution of the functions of Interpol. And then the policies are carried out by its secretariat. See, the policies will be on several specialized directorates for cybercrime, terrorism, drug trafficking, financial crime, environmental crime and human trafficking etc. Now, this is about the General Assembly. In between, we saw about secretariat, right? Now, we are going to see about that only. See, the day-to-day -day activities of Interpol are overseen by a full-time Secretary General elected by the General Assembly. And this Secretary General holds office for five years and this Secretary General is only responsible for the General Secretariat. So, what do we know from this? We know that General Assembly forms policies and Secretariat takes care of the day-to-day -day activities. Now, this is about the internal working of Interpol. Now, let us see how Interpol works in other countries. See, every member nation represents Interpol in that nation. Now, it may sound a little confusing, but I'll tell you what it is. See, all communications between a nation's law enforcement agency and the Interpol go through the top investigative body in that country. To be very specific, each member country hosts an Interpol National Central Bureau. And this National Central Bureau serves as the country's focal point for all the Interpol activities. See, don't get confused. All these points simply say that the connection between Interpol and the member nation is established through a National Central Bureau. And this National Central Bureau can be any organization in that member country. Now, in India, what is that organization? In India, the CBI assumes this role with one of its senior officers heading its exclusive interwing. So, as far as India is concerned, the National Central Bureau is the CBI and it only hosts Interpol activities in the country and it only establishes connection between Interpol and the nation's law enforcement agencies. See, they connect and communicate through a secure global police communications network called I-24-7. Remember this service? You can use it in your mains answer. Now, does this mean any member country can access any critical information anytime? No, really not. To access information, notices should be raised. See, Interpol notices are nothing but international request for cooperation or alerts. Once notices are accepted, then the police in the member countries will be allowed to share critical crime-related information. 
See, remember, these notices were published by the General Secretariat at the request of a National Central Bureau and they are made available to all of its member countries. See, most notices, they are for police use only and they are not made available to the public. Now, depending on the information sought, the notices are differentiated into different colors. You can see that in this image here. Red notice is for the wanted persons, yellow notice is for the missing persons, blue notice is for the additional information, black notice is for the unidentified bodies, green notice is for warnings and intelligence, orange notice is for imminent threat and purple notice is for modus operandi. See, these are some of the notices and they are different purposes. Now, among them, red notice is the most important one. Now, what is red notice? It is a structured communication issued by Interpol to all the member countries. See, this communication notifies the name of persons against whom an arrest warrant is pending in a particular country. See, the notice issued requests all member nations that if the named individual is located in their country, an immediate communication should be sent to the nation that wants him in connection with the criminal investigation. For example, in India, we used red corner notice to deport Vijay Malya. So, what does this mean? If we request for the red notice, Interpol will communicate with all of its member nations about Vijay Malya. And all other member nations, if they find any information about Vijay Malya and they know for sure that he is in their country, then that member country should immediately communicate to India that Vijay Malya is there. And this is how the red notice works. Now, coming to the news article, what can we expect from the Delhi meeting? See, the entire global police leadership will be in Delhi for this session. And those who want to see a stable global order continue to be concerned about the smuggling of narcotics and weapons. So, discussion about narcotics and weapons is expected to happen in the Delhi session. Now, let us conclude this article discussion by seeing some of the future challenges that lie in front of Interpol. Firstly, know that globally coordinated law enforcement response is necessary. When it is necessary, it is necessary to combat the growing threat of transnational, cyber and organized crime. So, in these cases, globally coordinated law enforcement response is necessary. So, regarding this, Interpol should work towards gaining the international cooperation and coordination. So, this is one challenge that lies in front of Interpol. Secondly, it must get the authority to impose sanctions on a nation that refuses to assist in the implementation of a red notice. So, compliance is the second challenge. So, these challenges should be addressed by Interpol to make the world a safer place to live. Now, that's all about this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Interpol, its main functions. We saw about different notices. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing some of the challenges that lie in front of Interpol. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, let us take up this news article. This article speaks about the next generation launch vehicle. See, yesterday, ISRO chairman announced that ISRO is developing a next-generation launch vehicle and this will replace Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle PSLV in future. See, the chairman also said that NGLV, that is the next-generation launch vehicle, will use semi-cryogenic technology. See, it is both efficient and cost-effective. And he also highlighted that the new rocket could also be reusable. See, if it is made reusable, it is going to have a smaller payload that would be around 5 tons. And also, if the rocket is made expendable, the payload capacity will also further go up to 10 tons. And this is the crux of the news article given here. Now, using this opportunity, we are going to learn about the differences between Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, PSLV, and Geosynchronous Satellite Launch Vehicle, GSLV. Now, the first difference is based on the generation. See, PSLV is the third generation satellite launch vehicle of India. Whereas, GSLV is the fourth generation satellite launch vehicle of India. Now, you may wonder, then what is the first and second generation launch vehicles? See, they are satellite launch vehicle SLV and augmented satellite launch vehicle ASLV respectively. Now, moving on to the next difference. Now, this difference is based on the orbits and their use. See, PSLV has earned the title of Work Horse of ISRO. 
See, this is because of its consistent delivery of various satellites to low Earth orbits. See, this is a general term. If the altitude of the orbit is low from the Earth, then it is called as low Earth orbits. It may range from 200 kilometers to 1,600 kilometers. And also know that PSLV is designed to deliver the Earth observation or remote sensing satellites to sun synchronous circular polar orbits of 600 km altitude. Now coming to GSLV, see GSLV is designated mainly to deliver the communication satellites to the highly elliptical geosynchronous transfer orbit. This is the major difference. Now moving on to the next difference. Now this is based on the stages of the launch vehicle. First let us see the PSLV. See PSLV is a four stage launch vehicle with the first and third stages using solid rocket motors and the second and fourth stages using liquid rocket engines. And also know that PSLV uses six strap on motors to augment the thrust provided by the first stage. Here you have to note that depending on the number of the strap-on boosters, the PSLV is classified into various versions like core alone version, PSLV CA, PSLV G and PSLV XL etc. See these strap-on motors and boosters they will be mounted on the sides of the launch vehicle. Now coming to the GSLV. See GSLV has three stages. The first stage uses a solid rocket motor, then the second stage uses a liquid rocket engine and the third stage uses the indigenously built cryogenic engine. See the cryogenic engine carries liquid hydrogen as fuel and liquid oxygen as oxidizer. We all know why oxidizer is used right, because there will be no oxygen in the space. But for combustion to occur we need oxygen and that is exactly why oxidizers are used. Now here also GSLV uses four liquid engine strap on motors for the thrust and there are different variants of GSLV launch vehicles based on the lift off capacity. They are GSLV Mark 1, GSLV Mark 2 and GSLV Mark 3. Now these are the three main differences between PSLV and GSLV. With this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this article discussion we saw that ISRO is developing a next generation launch vehicle and using this opportunity we saw about the differences between polar satellite launch vehicle and geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion. See this next article here it talks about the recent floods in the parts of Andhra Pradesh due to heavy rainfall. See the article also says that the state disaster response force team is working closely with police and fire department to rescue the people who are stranded. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context we are going to learn about the disaster management authorities and the legal structure of it. See India we all know that it is a disaster prone country. We have seen instances of disastrous floods, landslides, earthquakes and even tsunamis. And for this reason only, in the year 2005, the central government has enacted the Disaster Management Act for the efficient management of the disasters. See, even though the act was enacted in the year 2005, it came into force in January 2006. And this act only provides for the establishment for disaster management authorities at the national, state and district level. Now before getting to know about the authorities, we will see some of the definitions given in the Disaster Management Act 2005. Now the act defines the term disaster. It means a catastrophe, mishap calamity or grave occurrence in any area arising from natural or man-made causes. And the act also defines the term disaster management. It means a continuous and integrated process of planning, organizing, coordinating and implementing the measures which are necessary to manage disasters. Now with this basic terms, let us see about the authorities. First of all, let's see about the National Disaster Management Authority, which is shortly referred as NDMA. See here you should know a crucial fact. This authority, which is the National Disaster Management Authority, is a statutory body because it is established as per the Disaster Management Act of 2005. See, this NDMA is the apex body for disaster management in India at the national level. 
and it is headed by the Prime Minister of India who is the ex officio chairman. Now, NDA may also consist of other members who can be nominated by the chairperson, that is the Prime Minister. And these members should not exceed 9. Now, coming to the role of NDMA, See, NDMA is responsible for laying down the policies, plans and guidelines for disaster management. And it is also responsible for ensuring timely and effective response to disasters at the national level. This is about the NDMA. Now, moving on to see about the State Disaster Management Authority, which is shortly referred as SDMA. See, this is also a statutory body because this is also established under the Disaster Management Act of 2005. See, this SDMA, it is the apex body for disaster management at the state level. It is headed by Chief Minister of the Concerned State, who is the ex officio chairperson. Like the NDMA, SDMA also consists of other members who can be nominated by the chairperson, that is the Chief Minister of the Concerned State. Now, coming to the role of SDMA, like NDMA, SDMA is responsible for laying down policies and plans for disaster management in the state. Now, there is also a third authority which is known as the District Disaster Management Authority, DDMA. This is also a statutory body and the Act states that the state governments shall need to establish a District Disaster Management Authority for every district in the state. Now, it is headed by the district collector who is the ex officio chairperson. Now, this authority that is the District Disaster Management Authority also consists of other members other than the chairperson but the members should not exceed 7. Now, coming to the role of DDMA, see DDMA is very crucial because this authority only is responsible for planning, coordinating and implementing the disaster management policies and to take all measures for the purposes of disaster management in the district. So, this is about the authorities who manage the disasters in the country. Now, there are two forces which are called as National Disaster Response Force and State Disaster Response Force. See, these response forces, as the name suggests, they are constituted for the purpose of specialist response to a threatening disaster situation. So, if a disaster happens, these response forces only go to the disaster place and they perform the rescue operations. Now, that's all about this particular article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the authorities who manage the disasters in the country. We saw about National Disaster Management Authority, State Disaster Management Authority, District Disaster Management Authority and finally, we saw about the disaster response forces at the national and state level. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, see this article here. In this article discussion, first, we are going to see about the snow leopard and then I'll explain the news article. See, snow leopards are one of the world's most elusive cats. The snow leopard has a beautiful and spotted coat and this coat or the fur, it serves two purposes. One is that it helps the animal to insulate from the cold. And the other purpose is to be camouflaged so that it gives an edge while hunting. Now see these images here. Can you spot the difference between the surroundings and the cat? No, right? And that's how camouflaged their skin will be. See the scientific name for snow leopards is Panthera anchia. Does the name sound familiar? Yeah, you might have heard it several times. See this image to know about the other animals under the genus Panthera. It includes Jaguar, Panthera onca, Leopard, Panthera pardus, Tiger, Panthera tigris, Snow Leopard, Panthera anchia, Lion, Panthera leo. And now you know where you heard the name Panthera. See, just now I said that Snow Leopard's fur helped the animal to insulate from the cold. From this itself, you may wonder what is the habitat of Snow Leopard? See, snow leopards, they live in the mountainous regions of Central and Southern Asia. Now, look at this image here. Its habitat range extends across the mountainous regions of 12 countries. It includes Afghanistan, Bhutan, China, India, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz Republic, Mongolia, Nepal, Pakistan, Russia, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Now, coming to India-specific information. In India, their geographic range encompasses a large part of the Western Himalayas and also Eastern Himalayas. 
The states in the Western Himalayas include Union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, the states of Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. The states in the Eastern Himalayas include Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh. Now with this information let us see about the diet. See they prey on animals such as blue sheep, ibex, marmots, pikas and hares. So far we saw about the physical characteristics, habitat, diet. Now let us see about the threats faced by them and the conservation status. See the expansion of human settlement especially the livestock grazing has led to the increased man animal conflict. Here what happens is herders sometimes they kill the snow leopards to prevent the predation of their domestic animals. And apart from this snow leopards lives are also threatened by poaching illegal trades in pelt and body parts. See here pelt is nothing but stripped skin of animals. See this image here you will understand. Here the skin of the animal is stripped from the animal and this skin is illegally traded. See these animals are illegally traded to be used for the traditional Chinese medicine. And because of all of these reasons snow leopards are dramatically declining. See they have lost at least 20% of their population in two decades. and this happened as a result of the threats that we discussed now so to avoid the threats faced by snow leopards conservation efforts are taken to protect the snow leopards in the iucn red list of threatened species the snow leopard is listed as vulnerable and in addition to this the snow leopard is also listed in the appendix 1 of the convention on international trade of endangered species there is nothing but sites See this makes the trading of body parts of animals illegal in the signatory countries and it includes illegal trading of fur bones and meat now coming to india specific information the snow leopard is listed under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act 1972 and this gives snow leopards the highest protection status under the country's laws now apart from this india has launched two conservation efforts One is Project Snow Leopard. See, this project promotes an inclusive and participatory approach to conservation involving the local communities. And the second one is Secure Himalaya. It is a part of global partnership on wildlife conservation and crime prevention for sustainable development, and it is funded by Global Environment Facility. See, the Secure Himalaya it contributes to the Global Snow Leopard Ecosystem Protection Program, which is a joint initiative of 12 range countries, which includes governments, international agencies, civil societies, and the private sector. Now, so many conservation efforts are taken. So, you should know that why it is important to conserve snow leopards. See, snow leopards they are the top predators in their environment, and their prey include mountain sheep and goats. See without the snow leopards the ecological balance would be disrupted for example herbivore populations would increase and this results in changes to vegetation and it also affects other wildlife that live in the same areas see the same landscape they provide food and other important resources for many people who live there and this includes medicine wood for shelter heat and fuel We saw that if snow leopards population are disrupted then the ecological balance will be disrupted. So by protecting snow leopard we are benefiting the whole natural environment in these areas and the people who rely on it. And this is exactly why we should conserve snow leopards. Now coming to the news article. See the estimation of snow leopards is being conducted in the northeastern state of Arunachal Pradesh for the first time and it is done with the technical support from World Wildlife Fund for Nature. See the WWF India is doing the data analysis of the survey which has already been completed and the report is likely to be published on October 23rd this year and as we already saw in India snow leopards are found in Jammu and Kashmir Himachal Pradesh Uttarakhand Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh now the analysis is being done in Arunachal Pradesh because it forms a part of the eastern himalayas and this eastern himalayas is a priority global region for the world wildlife fund and the living himalayas network initiative and i have given here the details about the living himalayas network initiative so pause the video and go through it now when this article discussion we saw about snow leopards its physical characteristics diet 
habitat threats conservation status and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the news article which is about the survey of snow leopards in the state arunachal pradesh now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion today we have five prelims questions i'll solve four of them and one of them is a quiz question for you now let us take this first previous year prelims question which was asked in the year 2015 With reference to dugong a mammal found in India which of the following statements is or are correct statement 1 it is a herbivorous marine animal from our discussion itself you can easily say that statement 1 is correct it is an herbivorous animal it is a marine animal so statement 1 is correct now coming to statement 2 it is found along the entire coast of india see this also we saw in our discussion it is not found along the entire coast of india in india they are seen in gulf of manar gulf of kutch park bay and andaman and nicobar islands so statement 2 is incorrect Now statement 3 it is given legal protection under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act 1972 the statement is correct so what is the correct answer to this question we saw that statement 2 is incorrect so the correct answer is option c 1 and 3 now coming to the second question consider the following pass see on the left side articles are given and on the right side the explanation of the articles is given the first pair article 14 to 18 and the next pair is article 19 to 22 and the next one is article 23 to 24 and the next pair is article 25 to 28 see we all know that article 14 to 18 is right to equality 19 to 22 is right to freedom 23 to 24 is right against exploitation and 25 to 28 is right to freedom of religion so all the given pairs are correct here i am going to give you a task we saw the article numbers and the explanation of the articles in single line but you have to go and study what are all these articles and what are all the restrictions placed against this right take note of it and if you have already taken notes regarding fundamental rights then go and revise it now coming to the correct answer of the question what is the correct answer it is option d only four pairs Moving on to the third question consider the following statements with respect to geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle mark 3 statement 1 it is a four staged launch vehicle the statement is completely wrong see it is because geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle that is gslv it is a three stage launch vehicle this we saw in our discussion itself the first stage is solid rocket motor the second stage is liquid rocket engine and the third stage is indigenously built cryogenic engine now coming to the second statement it uses fully indigenous high thrust cryogenic engine named ce20 for upper stage the statement is correct now coming to statement 3 it is mainly used to deliver the communication satellites this also we saw in our discussion so what is the correct answer to this question statement 1 is wrong statement 2 and 3 are correct so the correct answer to this question is option b 2 and 3 only now coming to the fourth question consider the following statements with respect to national disaster response force ndrf statement 1 ndrf was constituted under the disaster management act 2005 for a specialized response to natural disasters only see the statement is incorrect see during our discussion we saw a definition for disasters right what was the definition given disaster means a catastrophe mishap calamity or grave occurrence in any area arising from natural or man made causes So the Disaster Management Act itself includes man-made disasters under the definition of disasters. So this statement which says that the NDRF caters to natural disasters only is incorrect. It also includes man-made disasters. Now coming to statement 2, NDRF comprises of 12 battalions which are trained and equipped to respond to disasters. See this statement is correct. At present, NDRF comprises of 12 battalions. See these battalions located in states which include Assam, West Bengal, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, Bihar, Andhra Pradesh and Arunachal Pradesh. And note that these battalions have been trained and equipped to respond to all man-made and natural disasters. See this is about the NDRF. We'll see an additional fact here. See, every state governments are required to raise their own state disaster response force, 
and this is for quickly responding to the disasters. See, SDRF are placed strategically at suitable locations, well connected to the airport, railheads and roads for their immediate deployment at the disaster sites. Now, this is an additional fact for you. Remember this. Now, coming back to the question, we saw that statement 1 is incorrect and statement 2 is correct. So, the correct answer to this question is option B, 2 only. Now, taking the final question, consider the following statements regarding snow leopards. Read the statements carefully, think for a moment and post your answer in the comment section. And also note that the question has asked for the incorrect statements. So, answer accordingly. Aspirants, I have displayed here a mains question for you. So, if you are interested, write the answer and post it in the comment section. And if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And with this, we have come to the end. If you like the video, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankaraya's Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.